And here we go. Welcome everybody to The Big Idea. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hanna here at Clear Chiropractic. Today we are talking about the importance of stability between the C1 and the C2 joints in the neck as they relate to the functional curve that should be in your neck. And particularly we're going to look at how car accidents or whiplash injuries can contribute towards some of that instability. So we're going to be touching on a, a couple little things, a little bit of research here first that's in a slightly different vein, but then we're going to bring that back around to why C1, C2 stability is such an important factor. And this is going to be whether you're experiencing headaches, dizziness, tingling into the hands, tingling into the legs. We're going to be covering how that can create a whole bunch of different problems. So let's go ahead and jump into that. Hope you enjoy. All right, so where we're going to start is with an article summary related to rheumatoid arthritis. And this is going to make sense in a little bit what this has to do. Atlantoaxial, so C1, C2, instability in the course of rheumatoid arthritis in relation to selected parameters of sagittal balance. We are talking about the curve of the neck as if you're looking in a side profile like this. I'll show you a little video in just a moment, but right now we're talking about the curve that should be present in your neck. Atlantoaxial instability is the most common cervical instability in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Reason for this is people have genetic and inflammatory susceptibilities where it creates damage to the joints themselves, which means that things can start moving way, way, way too much. There's a difference with ligaments between, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, there's a difference between thinning, tearing, and torn. We're not necessarily talking about torn ligaments, but we are talking about thinning or tearing kind of ligaments that start to produce abnormal kinds of motion. So the presented study conducted on a group of rheumatoid patients with cervical instability was performed to look for a relationship between C1, C2 instability and sagittal balance. The conclusions among the examined selected parameters, a statistically significant relationship between instability and the Cobb angle, which is a way that you can measure the functional curve of the neck, has been found. In other words, if something goes wrong at C1 and C2, there is the possibility that it's changing the curve in the neck, and this is not going to be a good thing. So when we're talking about the change of the curve of the neck, this is something that we should normally be seeing. So we've got the weight of the head, approximately 10 pounds, sitting on a nice flexible curve like this. The neck should not be straight. It should have an arch with it something. So if this is forward facing like this, it should have a curve or an arch like this so that it maintains flexibility and works like a spring rather than a rigid column. That's where we start having all kinds of disc issues, ligament issues, nerve issues, all that sort of stuff. So as I'm going to illustrate this here for you, even though we're seeing only the bones right through here, you've also got a muscles attached ligaments attached and also the nerves that are going to come down through this. So a sagittal curve should be like this. And what we're talking about and what the researchers were finding in again this group that's susceptible, so rheumatoid patients, that when you have damage at C1 and C2, this is what starts to happen. We're going to have a straightening of the neck that starts to produce abnormal pressure, direct mechanical pressure on the muscles, the ligaments, the joints, and potentially even the, the nerves over a period of time. And this can lead to degenerative arthritis. This can lead to lots and lots of different associated issues because as I've talked about on a lot of different videos on this channel here, that you have all kinds of nerve receptors that are going to be going up to the brain that are responsible not just for pain, but also for balance and also for uh, pressure kind of sensations. And when we start to have this straightening effect, it can also have the effect of starting to put a little bit of stretch onto the spinal cord itself. Normal circumstances, when you tuck your chin down like this, your spinal cord is actually going to stretch about 10% of its length. Now that's fine if you're just tucking your chin down like this, but imagine what would happen if you have a cumulative stretch 
over years, months, decades. That is not going to be a good thing. That can lead to disc damage. That can lead to what's known as a cervical myelopathy, which very commonly produces tingling down into the hands, produces low back pain, tingling down into the legs. You can have all kinds of therapies done for the low back, but that's not quite resolving the issue itself because you're having downward symptoms from an issue that's actually a lot higher up. But what we also know from the, the research is that when you damage the, the C1, C2, and it's not quite as strong as it should be, you can also have an upward migration of this area right through here that can start to produce mechanical stress and strain on the brainstem itself. And that area is only going to be responsible for every single one of your vital life function, heart, lung, digestive system. It's where the centers that process balance equilibrium are. So headaches, migraines, dizziness, vertigo, chronic pain, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, all of the th these things are associated with damage and, you know, things that are not functioning properly in this particular area. Now, I do want to emphasize that, especially when you're talking about some of these more complex kind of conditions, I'm not saying that this is the one and only thing that can produce that. What I'm saying, at least based on the, the research here, not just the one that I showed you, but also other bits of research, is that C1, C2 integrity is very, very important for the function of your body. Now, before we go any farther, there's two things that I want to emphasize here. Number one, even though the study that I just showed you was referencing rheumatoid arthritis, again, people who are genetically susceptible to tearing or thinning of the ligaments, that this is not going to be a discussion that's limited to rheumatoid arthritis because we can also have acquired instability or ligament damage, particularly anything where your head has snapped back and forward like this. We are talking about whiplash injuries that commonly will be caused in car accidents, but can happen with any impact acti activity. Sports tackles, injuries, falls, hitting the ground at the wrong angle, hitting your head on a cupboard, on the back of a car, any number of different things that are going to cause damage, maybe not broken bones, bruising, or even bleeding, but damage to the structure on the inside. So rheumatoid is kind of giving us a, a proxy understanding of what can happen with other kinds of injuries. But I also want to emphasize the second point. So what I've got here for you is a little giant model of the C1 vertebra and the C2. So C1 is designed to support the weight of the head as you're nodding your head up and down like this. C1 and C2 is the one that lets you pivot your head like this. And what's important to recognize here is that C1 and C2, it is the only joint in your entire spine that provides for what's known as axial rotation, straight turning side to side. And I've talked about this in other videos. And in many ways, it is the body's universal balancing account. If you've got an issue, whether it's at the very top or whether it's all the way down in your foot, your body will produce compensatory misalignments of C1 and C2. And over time, what that can do is that can start to produce a stretching of the ligaments that even if it's not again torn, can start to produce some of these same kinds of issues. What my point here is, is that People can have issues at C1 and C2, but that does not always mean that is where the primary problem is coming from. But nevertheless, these are the structures that are going to be involved. And we're going to have a little look at the ligaments that are involved. We're going to tie this back into whiplash and how even low speed accidents can produce a whole bunch of different issues. Okay, so what do I have for you right here. I've got a picture where essentially what we're doing is we're looking through the, the back side of the C1 and the C2 as if we've taken the head away, taken all the muscles away. So we're looking at the ligaments that are located deep on the inside. And we're going to be covering three ligaments in particular because these are the three strongest ligaments that support the head onto the top of the spine right here. In other words, if these guys are damaged, then you know you had some kind of an impact. And then some of the weaker ligaments, most likely they're also gonna be damaged here. So number one, the strongest ligament in the upper part of the neck, it's what's known as the transverse atlantal ligament. And what that does is that runs across the back of the C2 right here, 
like this. It's essentially a strap that is holding the C1 onto the C2 because if this is where your spine is supposed to be sitting right in this space right here, the last thing that you would ever want would be the ligament located right here to be torn, in which case this starts to happen and you're talking about imminent surgery, medical emergency. There's no conservative when we're dealing with something severe like that. But again, we're not talking about that level of injury. So what I have on the illustration here, so again, backside of the C1, uh, this is the left side, this is the right side, and then here would be the, the tip of the, the spine would be, we're talking deep on the inside, transverse atlantal ligament is this one right here from point C to point C, as we see right there. Now, this ligament, it will not start to damage or become damaged unless it's exposed to 350 newtons worth of force. Now, you might be wondering, how many newtons is that in terms of miles an hour, in terms of pounds? We'll come around to that a little bit. But for right now, I just want you to remember that this guy, pretty dang strong, and it takes a lot of force to actually damage it, 350 newtons. Now, I'm going to skip ahead to the third strongest ligament in the neck, and I'll come back to the, the second one in just a moment. But the third strongest is what's known as the ALAR ligament. So that's this guy located right here. What this guy does is this guy anchors onto the top of the C2 and straps it strongly onto the rim of the inside of the skull itself. So not only do we have something that's going to be strongly anchoring C1 and C2, we're also going to be having something that is strongly anchoring the C2 direct onto the skull. This guy will not tear unless it's exposed to about 250 to 200 to 250 newtons worth of force. So not quite as strong as the transverse atlantal, but still pretty darn strong. And the last one that I'm going to highlight, this one's actually the second strongest. So again, I've gone slightly out of order here. This one is the capsular ligament between the C1 and between the base of the skull itself. So on the model, if I had the, the skull itself, and I can do that just ever so quickly, kind of like this, we're talking about the ligament that anchors this guy onto these spots right through here. So I've illustrated it in the yellow. Uh, do forgive me to all of the anatomists out there because I do have a, an error on this picture, not in this particular area here, but it's on one of the ligaments along the front here, blah, blah, blah. This blue guy should actually be going along the front right through there. So I'll go back and I'll fix that uh, a little bit, but we're still accurate when we're talking about the, the C1 anchoring to the, the skull right through here. This guy will not tear unless exposed to about 300 newtons worth of force. So the strongest one, 350 up to about 400. Then you've got this guy, which is anchoring the skull to the C1. This is going to be about 300 newtons worth of force. And then you've got 200 to 250 for those ALAR ligaments that anchor C2 onto the, the base of the skull. So pretty strong ligaments. These are the ones that we're talking about are involved. So now, when we're talking about instability, we're talking about maybe not completely torn or ruptured ligaments, but we're talking about ligaments that have been injured either through repetitive stress, kind of like stretching a rubber band, or a forceful impact, maybe even a series of impacts that are producing accumulative damage to where those ligaments originally super duper strong, they start to stretch like this. And as we had said, is if you start to have excessive amounts of motion at C1 and C2, at least as the research is showing, this can number one, create an upward migration on the base of the skull like this to where it starts to drop down, can start producing pressure at the level of the brainstem. But what it can also do is it can affect that normal curve in the neck to where it starts to straighten. And as that happens, that starts to create more muscular ligamentous and maybe even neurological issues going down. So this is the junction that we're talking about. And this is honestly something that goes very often underdiagnosed. Reason for this, when a person's been in an accident, specifically I'm referring to a car accident, you're going to go, assuming that you've got some issues, you're going to go to the hospital, they're going to do a CT scan, and they're looking for, like I said, broken bones, bleeding, dislocations, things like that. But in the absence of those, what they commonly will say is, you're okay, it's just a soft tissue injury, it will heal on its own. Now here's the problem, is 
they're looking for overt pathology. They're looking for ligaments that are straight out torn. They're not looking for these smaller kinds of issues that can nevertheless still produce a whole bunch of pain, dizzy, brain fog, all kinds of different issues going on with either brain or body. This requires a deeper look. And very commonly, a standard CT will not show evidence of this. You either need a high-resolution MRI, which unfortunately, if they're looking at the head, they commonly stop right before they get to the neck. And if they're looking at the neck, they commonly stop right before they get to this critical area right here, meaning that a huge amount of these different things go underdiagnosed. And people can have all kinds of different health issues, not realizing that maybe this is part of the problem. My point here is, is that when person's diagnosed with just a soft tissue injury, we're not just necessarily talking about, oh, this is a small thing, nothing to worry about. This is something that nevertheless needs treatment. And the longer that that treatment is delayed, the more complicated it's going to be because if the curve of the neck starts to straighten and if your body has to start to find other ways to compensate for that stress, that's going to lead to a certain degree of irreversible degenerative damage. We're talking arthritis. We're talking about neurological injury. We're talking about muscle contracture where things are getting physically shorter and that's going to set a person up for all kinds of different issues later on in life. My point is that if and where you've ever been in a car accident, if you've ever had a sports injury of any kind where there was a definite knock, and even if you thought no problem, it's still getting thing, it's still worth getting things looked at and properly assessed to make sure that everything actually is okay. Better to protect and to prevent than to wait for crisis and hope for cure. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump on over to a little calculator that you can see if you've ever been in a car accident or again some kind of a whiplash injury how much force is actually involved with relatively low speed hits. Okay, so here's what I've done. I've done I've gone over to what's called a gigacalculator.com. I'll put the the link right in here where you can put in a few factors so that you can actually calculate how many newtons of force are involved with actual injury. So remember again, we're talking about the strength of these ligaments that are going to be supporting the normal weight of your head and be providing that C1, C2 motion, that these things are going to be somewhere between 200 up to about 400 newtons worth of total strength. Anything beyond that, these ligaments can become damaged. So you can put in a, a few different factors. And here is the, the reason why I put in the, the factors that I have right through here. And somebody in the, the comments, if they wanted to make a correction, I'm all open to this. But what have I done? Number one is I put body mass at 10 pounds. Why did I put 10 pounds? Because 10 pounds is about the weight of an average person's head. I haven't put the weight of the body. I haven't put the weight of a vehicle or anything like that. I'm just wanting to say, okay, that if we're involved in an impact where the head goes like this and snaps back and forth, the 10 pound weight, how much is that actually going to be moving and how much shear force is going to go directly into these ligaments that we want to talk about. So 10 pounds right there. Impact velocity, I'm going to fiddle with this a little bit here and you can change the, the units if you wanted uh, kilometers per hour, kilometers per second, but I'm going to keep it in miles an hour because I know most of the people watching this video will understand miles per hour. Now, collision distance, I put two inches. Why did I put two inches? Because if a person's gonna be in a car, most of the time when people drive for right or for wrong, they're sticking their head a little bit forward like this. And so when their head is going to snap, it's going to snap like this. And I'm saying it's gonna be moving approximately two inches like this. In all honesty, it could be a little bit more which would be producing a little bit nastier kinds of things. So I'm low, I'm going relatively conservative. And then as far as impact duration, I've set my units not in seconds, but I've set it in milliseconds and I've set it to 150. The reason for that is because the average whiplash is going to occur in 150 milliseconds. That's all it takes. So a lot of times people that are in a car accident, even a low speed fender bender, and they say, oh, I didn't feel like my head moved at all. Well, all it has to do like that, but it happens so fast that unless somebody happens to have like a 
slow or a high res camera to see how much movement actually incurred, odds are it happened so fast that you didn't actually feel it. So let's go ahead and put these initial parameters in there. And what I'm going to start with is I'm going to start with just simply put five miles an hour. And we will calculate right down through there. Average impact force, 223 newtons through your head at only five miles an hour with a peak impact force of 446. What did we say about the strength of those ligaments? The strongest ligaments that support the base of your head to the C1 and the C2, and then the C1 to the C2, they are between, they will start to tear or thin with impacts 200 to 400 newtons worth of force. All it takes to produce injury to these ligaments is five miles an hour, let alone if we are perhaps driving on a highway. And let's say that we're at a stop, but the person behind us is not paying attention and they go straight into the back of us. You know what? I'm going to still go pretty darn conservative. Let's say that they get on the brakes a little bit and so they're still deaccelerating into you at 25 miles an hour. Let's calculate and see what that says. Now you'll notice that the unit changes. It changes now to kilonewtons. So that means that it's a thousand times greater. So this particular impact, 25 miles an hour, 5,576 newtons with a peak impact force of 11,153 newtons. Way more than is actually necessary to injure these ligaments. But again, how often is this the case? People are involved in some kind of an impact injury. And again, it's not always a car accident. It can be going off your bike if you're a, a mountain bike rider or a road bike. It can be you're out for a run, you trip, you don't get your hands out and you smack your head like this. Or you're playing sports and you get tackled from the side. More on that. My point here is that as strong as these ligaments are, it doesn't take very much force at all in our modern society with fast moving vehicles to produce pretty darn pronounced injuries to these various ligaments. And you want to make things worse. If you can see that you're about to get hit, odds are you're going to brace a little bit like that. And the good news is it means that your muscles will absorb some of the force. In other words, it's not going to go all into the ligaments. However, if you do not see that you're about to get hit, there's no bracing that's going on. So all of that impact is going to go direct into these ligaments. And even worse, if your head was turned at the side, because forward and back is bad enough. But if your head is tipping or turned, it's far more likely that you're actually going to have more of that impact going into and potentially disrupting those various ligaments. So what I just wanted to show you here is that despite the myth that it takes a large amount of force to actually cause problems in the body, the truth is, is it doesn't. All it takes is an impact as low as five miles an hour to damage the ligaments that only anchor your head onto the entire rest of your spine. And as we saw, if those ligaments are damaged, again, this is through proxy of the uh, research that was done with the rheumatoid population. If you damage those ligaments, this is setting you up for further problems that are going to go down into your neck like this as the neck starts to straighten itself out, leading to disc damage, osteoarthritis, myelopathy, myelopathies, neuropathies. But what we also know is that it goes upward and has the tendency to produce a bit of a kinking effect at the base of the head here that starts to set a person up more for balance kind of issues, more for chronic pain, chronic fatigue, all kinds of different things that are going to be more brain related. And as we also said, oftentimes these problems go undiagnosed for the simple reason it's not broken bones, it's not torn, it's not bleeding, but they're not looking at the functional relationships of what's actually going on here. So people oftentimes are not getting care until on an average 15 years after something like this has happened because we walk away from an injury, we are told that we're okay, it's just a soft tissue strain, it'll go on away on its own. What if it doesn't? What if you actually needed treatment at the time, didn't get it because you didn't recognize the severity of what's going on? So what are some of the take-home messages right through here? Number one, 
is if you are ever involved in some kind of notable traumatic event, car accident, sports injury, or anything where you really sheared, you really felt your neck snap, it's worth getting it looked at. Beyond just the, is it broken bones and all this sort of stuff, you wanna work with either an upper cervical chiropractor and or physical therapist, somebody who's gonna be focusing on the health, the stability, the function of these joints, who understands what's actually going on on the inside, who's not going to just dismiss, say, ah, take a few painkillers, it's gonna go away. No, we need to make sure that if things are gonna be healing the right way, because it's the innate forces of your body that do all the healing, we wanna make sure that things are gonna be healing the right way, that something has not gotten locked into a wrong position where it ends up healing the wrong way and that sets you up for injuries down the track. So typically what this involves, number one is getting a bit of a detailed history about what the nature of the injury was. Number two, doing series of physical neurological diagnostic tests to find out what's going on. And then do a series of tests to see what's going on with the functional relationships, the alignment, the motion stability on the inside. So this can be either a DMX study, so digital motion x-ray. This can be a DAX study, digital articular x-ray, where you're looking at the alignment of the, the various vertebra. This can be done with a CBCT scan, same thing. You're looking at the overall alignment, the relationships of these vertebra. And sometimes if the issue is very, very severe, you may need an MRI, but you wanna make sure that when you're looking at that MRI, that you're looking at the integrity of the ligaments. I did a video on this very, very recently. What are the things that you need to look for on an MRI if you're expecting that there is ligament damage? Because this is very, very commonly underdiagnosed because the signs, even though very, very subtle, can be very significant point is, is that when you go through this process to find out what's actually going on, then you have a much better opportunity to be able to resolve those issues. Oftentimes, these kinds of things can be managed conservatively. It doesn't require surgery. Surgery is only, again, when you're dealing with overt tear and there is a full-blown instability. But as we also said, C1 and C2, it's the body's grand compensation joint. Where that problem is, is not always where it's starting from in the first place. Because if you had damage between the skull and C1 or C2, C3 or somewhere lower in your neck, that C1 and C2 is going to have to compensate for that in some way or another. So if you can restore stability through those other areas of the spine, through chiropractic care, through exercise, through strengthening, through the right kinds of stretching exercises, then those ligaments have an opportunity to heal. And even though they may not always heal 100%, at best, we're only ever going to get 70% of that function back, things can be managed conservatively so it's not setting you up for future kinds of issues. And of course, there is always the option that if you needed something like Regenex, prolotherapy, if those ligaments are really, really damaged, or indeed, even if you did need surgery, it nevertheless requires that you have a good understanding of what's going on, being able to look beyond just that, oh, it's a basic soft tissue injury, looking deep on the inside to find out based on where you are, what the nature of the injury was, what do you need to do so that you can get the best possible results so that you can get back to enjoying things in life the way that you really want. So thank you guys, as always, for watching this video. As if you did find it valuable, informative, and hopefully not too boring, please do like and subscribe to the channel so that other people can find this information. And if you've got that friend, family member, client, colleague that you think needs to benefit from watching this, they've been to the doc, they've been to the specialist, they've had some kind of a past neck injury, but everybody says your tests are normal that this may explain a little bit about what's actually going on and what they can do differently. If you want some more information or a little bit want to reach out to us, find out how we can help, you can visit our website, which is clearchirospokane.com. You can also check out any of the other videos that I've done on the, the channel here for both people who experience these things, but also a good number that are involved for practitioners as well, so they have a better understanding of what's going on here. But feel free to reach out to us at any time. We'd be delighted to help in any way we can. So thank you guys again for watching. This is Dr. Jeffrey Hanna, Clear Chiropractic. Get well, live well, stay well. Till next time, take care. Bye-bye.